Phantomina, or Love in a Maze. In love, the victors from the vanquished fly. They fly that wound, and they pursue that die. Waller. A young lady of distinguished birth, beauty, wit, and spirit happened to be in a box one night at the playhouse, where, though there were a great number of celebrated toasts, she perceived several gentlemen extremely pleased themselves with entertaining a woman who sat in the corner of the pit, and, by her manner of receiving them, might easily be known to be one of those who come there for no other purpose than to create acquaintance with as many as seem desirous of it. She could not help testifying her contempt of men who, regardless of either the play or the circle, threw away their time in such a manner to some ladies that sat by her. But they, either less surprised by being more accustomed to such sights than she, who had been bred for the most part in the country, or not of a disposition to consider anything very deeply, took but little notice of it. She still thought of it, though, however, and the longer she reflected on it, the greater was her wonder that men, some of whom she knew were accounted to have wit, should have taste so very depraved. This excited a curiosity in her to know in what manner these creatures were addressed. She was young, a stranger to the world, and consequently to the dangers of it, and having nobody in town at the time to whom she was obliged to be accountable for her actions. She did in everything as her inclinations or humors rendered most agreeable to her. Therefore she thought it not in the least a fault to put into practice immediately what came into her head, to dress herself as near as she could in the fashion of those women who make sale of their favors and set herself in the way of being costed as such a one, having at that time no other aim than the gratification of an innocent curiosity. She no sooner designed this frolic than she put it in execution and, muffling her hoods over her face, went the next night into the gallery box and, practicing as much as she had observed at that distance the behavior of that woman, was not long before she found her disguise had answered the ends she wore it for. A crowd of purchasers of all degrees and capacities were in a moment gathered about her, each endeavoring to outbid the other in offering her a price for her embraces. She listened to them all and was not little diverted in her mind at the disappointment she should give to so many, each of which thought himself secure of gaining her. She was told by them all that she was the most lovely woman in the world, and some cried, God, she is mighty like my fine lady, such a one, naming her own name. She was naturally vain and received no small pleasure in hearing herself praised, though in the person of another and a supposed prostitute. But she dispatched as soon as she could all that had hitherto attacked her when she saw the accomplished Beauplaisir was making his way through the crowd as fast as he was able to reach the bed she sat on. She had often seen him in the drawing room and talked with him, but then her quality and reputed virtue kept him from using her without freedom she now expected he would do, and had discovered something in him which had made her often think she should not be displeased if he would abate some part of his reserve. Now was the time to have her wishes answered. He looked in her face and fancied, as many others had done, that she very much resembled that lady whom she really was. But the vast disparity there appeared between their characters prevented him from entertaining even the most distant thought that they could be the same. He addressed her at first with the usual salutations of her pretended profession, as, Are you engaged, madam? Will you permit me to wait on you home after the play? By heaven, you are a fine girl. How long have you used this house? And such questions. But perceiving she had a turn of wit and gentle manner in her raillery, beyond what is frequently to be found among those wretches who are for the most part gentlewomen, but by necessity, few of them having had an education suitable to what they affect to appear, he 
he changed the form of his conversation and showed her it was not because he understood no better that he had made use of expressions so little polite. In fine, they were infinitely charmed with one another. He was transported to find so much beauty and wit in a woman, whom he doubted not but on very easy terms he might enjoy, and she found a vast deal of pleasure in conversing with him in this free and unrestrained manner. They passed their time all in the play with an equal satisfaction, but when it was over she found herself involved in a difficulty which before had never entered into her head, but which she knew what, not well how to get over. The passion he professed for her was not of that humble nature which can be content with distant adorations. He resolved not to part from her without the gratifications of those desires she had inspired, and, presuming on the liberties which her supposed function allowed of, told her she must either go with him to some convenient house of his procuring, or permit him to wait on her to her own lodgings. Never had she been in such a dilemma. Three or four times did she open her mouth to confess her real quality, but the influence of her ill stars prevented it by putting an excuse into her head which did the business as well, and at the same time did not take from her the power of seeing and entertaining him a second time with the same freedom she had done this. She told him she was under obligations to a man who had maintained her and whom she durst not disappoint having promised to meet him that night at a house hard by. This story, like so what those ladies sometimes tell, was not at all suspected by Beauplaisir, and assuring her that he would be far from doing her prejudice, he desired that in return for the pain he should suffer in being deprived of her company that night, that she would order her affairs so as not to render him unhappy the next. She gave a solemn promise to be in the same box on the morrow evening, and they took leave of each other, her to the tavern to drown the remembrance he to the tavern to drown the remembrance of his disappointment, she in a hackney chair, hurried home to indulge contemplation on the frolic she had taken, designing nothing less on her first reflections than to keep her promise, and hugging herself with the joy that she had the good luck to come off undiscovered. But these cogitations were of a short continuance. They vanished with the hurry of her spirits and were succeeded by others vastly different and ruinous. All the charms of Beauplaisir came fresh into her mind. She languished. She almost died for another opportunity of conversing with him. And not all the admonitions of her discretion were effectual to oblige her to deny laying a hold of what offered itself the next night. She depended on the strength of her virtue to bear her safe through the trials more dangerous than she apprehended this to be, and, never having been addressed by him as lady, was resolved to receive his devoirs as a town mistress, imagining a world of satisfaction to herself in engaging him in the character of such a one, and in observing the surprise he would be in to find himself refused by a woman whom he supposed granted her favors without exception. Strange and unaccountable were the whimsies she was possessed of, wild and incoherent her desires, unfixed and undetermined her resolutions, but in seeing Beauplaisir in the manner she had lately done. As for her proceedings with him, or how a second time to escape him without discovering who she was, she could neither assure herself nor whether or not the last extremity she would do so. Bent, however, on meeting him, whatever should be the consequence, she went out some hours before the time of going to the playhouse and took lodgings in a house not very far from it, intending that, if she should insist on passing some part of the night with her, to carry him there, thinking she might with more sincerity to her honor entertain him at a place where she was mistress than any of his own choosing. The appointed hour being arrived, she had the satisfaction to find his love in his assuity. He was there before her, and nothing could be more tender than the manner in which he accosted her. But from the first moment she came into that of the play being done, 
he continued to assure her no consideration should prevail with him to part from her again, as she had done the night before, and she rejoiced to think that she had taken the precaution of providing herself with a lodging to which she thought she might invite him without running any risk, either of her virtue or reputation. Having told him she would admit of his accompanying her home, he seemed perfectly satisfied, leaving her to the place, which was not about twenty minute houses distant, would have ordered a collation to be brought after them, but she would not permit it, telling him she was not one of those who suffered themselves to be treated at their own lodgings, and, as soon as she was come in, sent a servant belonging to the house to bribe by a very handsome supper and wine and everything was served to the table in a manner which showed the director neither wanted money nor was ignorant how it should be laid out. This proceeding, though it did not take from him the opinion that she was what she appeared to be, yet it gave him thoughts of her which he had not before. He believed her mistress, but he believed her to be one of a superior rank, and began to imagine the possession of her would be much more expensive than at first he had expected. But, not being of a humor to grudge anything for his pleasures, he gave himself no farther trouble than what were occasioned by fears of not having money enough to reach her price about him. Supper being over, which was intermixed with a vast deal of amorous conversation, he began to explain himself more than he had done, and both by his words and behavior let her know he would not be denied that happiness. The freedoms she allowed had made him hope. It was vain, and she would have retracted the encouragement she had given. In vain she endeavored to delay till next meeting the fulfilling of his wishes. She had now gone too far to retreat. He was bold, he was resolute, she fearful, confused, altogether unprepared to resist in such encounters, and rendered more so by the extreme liking she had to him. Shocked, however, at the apprehension of really losing her honor, she struggled all she could, and was just going to reveal the whole secret of her name and quality when the thought of the liberty he had taken with her, and those he still continued to prosecute, prevented her with representing the dangers of being exposed. The whole affair made a theme for public ridicule. Thus much, indeed, she told him that she was a virgin and had assumed this manner of behavior only to engage him but that he little regarded, or if he had, would not have been far from obliging him to desist. Nay, in the present burning eagerness of desire, tis probable that he had been acquainted both with who and what she really was. The knowledge of her birth would not have influenced him with respect sufficient to have curbed his wild exuberance of his luxurious wishes, or made him in that longing, that impatient moment, change the form of his addresses. In fine, she was undone, and he gained a victory so highly rapturous that, had he known over whom, scarce he could have triumphed more. Her tears, however, and the distraction she appeared in after the ruinous ecstasy was passed, as it heightened his wonder, so it abated his satisfaction. She could not imagine for what a reason a woman who, if she intended not to be a mistress, had counterfeited the part of one, and taken so much pains to engage him, should lament a consequence which she should not but expect, and, till the last test, seemed inclinable to grant, and was both surprised and troubled at the mystery. He admitted nothing that he thought might make her easy, and, still retaining an opinion of that hope of interest he had been the chief, had been the chief motive which had led her to act in the manner which she had done, and believing that she might know so little of him as to suppose, now she had nothing left to give he might not make that recompense she expected for her favors. To put her out of that pain, he pulled out of his pocket a purse of gold, entreating her to accept of that as an earnest of what he intended to do for her, assuring her with ten thousand protestations that he would spare nothing which his whole estate could purchase to procure her content and happiness. This treatment made her quite forget the part that she had assumed, and throwing it from her with an air of disdain, is this a reward, she said, 
for condescension such as I have yielded to? Can all the wealth you are possessed of make a reputation for my loss of honor? Oh no, I am undone beyond the powers of heaven itself to help me. She uttered many more such exclamations, which the amazed Beauplazier heard without being able to reply to, till by degrees sinking from that rage of temper, her eyes resumed their softening glances, and, guessing at the consternation he was in, No, my dear Beauplazier, added she, your love alone can compensate for the shame you have involved me in. Be you sincere and constant, and I hereafter shall perhaps be satisfied my fate and forgive myself the folly that betrayed me to you. Beauplazier thought he could not have a better opportunity than these words gave him of inquiring who she was and wherefore she had feigned herself to be of a profession which he was now convinced she was not. And after he had made her a thousand vows of an affection as inviolable and ardent as she could wish to find in him, entreated she would inform him by what means his happiness had been brought about, and also to whom he was indebted for the bliss he had enjoyed. Some remains of yet unextinguished modesty and sense of shame made her blush exceedingly at this demand, but recollecting herself in a little time, she told him so much of the truth as to what related to the frolic she had taken of satisfying her curiosity in what manner mistresses of the sort she appeared to be were treated by those who addressed them, but forbore discovering her true name and quality for the reasons she had done before, resolving if he boasted of this affair, he should not have it in his power to touch her character. She therefore said she was the daughter of a country gentleman who was come to town to buy clothes, and that she was called Fatamina. He had no reason to distrust the truth of this story, and was therefore satisfied with it, but did not doubt the, but by the beginning of her conduct, but that in the end she would be in reality the thing so artfully counterfeited, and had good nature enough to pity the misfortune she he imagined would be her lot. But to tell her so, or offer his advice in that point, was not his business, at least as yet. They parted not till toward morning, and she obliged him to a willing vow of visiting her the next day at three in the afternoon. It was too late for her to go home that night, therefore contenting herself with lying there, in the morning she sent for the woman of the house to come up to her, and, easily perceiving by her manner that she was a woman who might be influenced by gifts, made a present of a couple broad pieces, and desired her that if the gentleman who had been there the night before should ask any questions concerning her, that he should be told she was lately come out of the country, had lodged there about a fortnight, and that her name was Fantomina. I shall also, added she, lie but seldom here, nor indeed ever come but in those times where I expect to meet him. I would therefore have you order it, so that he may think I am but just gone out, if he should happen by any accident to call when I am not here. For I would not for the world have him imagine I do not constantly lodge here. The lady assured her that she would do everything as she desired, and gave her to understand she wanted not the gift of secrecy. Everything being ordered at this home for the security of her reputation, she repaired to the other, where she easily excused to an unsuspecting aunt with whom she boarded, her having been abroad all night, saying she went with a gentleman and his lady in a barge to a little country seat of theirs up the river, all of them designing to return the same evening, but that one of the bargemen happening to be taken ill all of a sudden, and no waterman to be got that night, they were obliged to towery till morning. Thus did this lady's wit and vivacity assist her in all but where it was most needful. She had discernment to foresee and avoid all those ills which might attend the loss of her reputation, but was wholly blind to those of the ruin of her virtue, and having managed her affairs so as to secure the one, grew perfectly easy with the remembrance that she had forfeited the other. The more she reflected on the merits of Beauplazier, the more she excused herself for what she had done, and the prospect of that continued bliss she expected to share with him 
took from her all remorse for having engaged in an affair which promised her so much satisfaction, and in which she found not the least danger of misfortune. If he is really, said she to herself, the faithful, the constant lover he has sworn to be, how charming will be our amour! And if he should be false and grow satiated like other men, I shall but, at the worst, have the private vexation of knowing I have lost him. The intrigue being a secret, my disgrace will be so too. I shall fear no whispers as I pass. She is forsaken. The odious word forsaken will never wound my ears, nor will the wrongs excite either the mirth or pity of the talking world. It will not be even in the power of my undoer himself to triumph over me. And while he laughs at and perhaps despises the fond, the yielding Fantomina, he will revere and esteem the virtuous, the reserved lady. In the manner he did, she applaud her own conduct, and exult with the imagination that she had more prudence than all her sex beside. And it must be confessed, indeed, that she preserved an economy in the management of this intrigue beyond what almost any woman but herself ever did. In the first place, by making no person in the world a confidant in it, and in the next, in concealing from Beauplaisir the knowledge who she was, for though she met him three or four days in a week at that lodging she had taken for that purpose, yet as much as he employed her time and thoughts, he was never, she was never missed from the, any assembly she had been accustomed to frequent. The business of her love had engrossed her till six in the evening, and before seven she had been dressed in a different habit and in another place. Slippers and a nightgown loosely flowing has been the garb in which he had left the languishing Fantomina, laced and adorned with all the blaze of jewels has he, in less than an hour after, beheld at the royal chapel, in the palace gardens, drawing room, opera, or play, the haughty, awe-inspiring lady. A thousand times he had stood amazed at the prodigious likeness between his little mistress and his country beauty, but was still as far from imagining they were the same as he was the first hour he had accosted her in the playhouse, though it is not impossible but that her resemblance to this celebrated lady might keep his inclination alive something longer than otherwise they would have been, and that it was to the thoughts of this, as he supposed unenjoyed charmer, she owed in great measure the vigor of his later caresses. But he varied not so much from his sex as to be able to prolong desire of any great length after possession. The rifle charms of Fantomina soon lost their poignancy and grew tasteless and inspid, and when, the season of the year inviting the company to the bath, she offered to accompany him, he made an excuse to go without her. She easily perceived his coldness, and the reason why he pretended her going would be inconvenient, and endured as much from the discovery as any of her sex could do. She dissembled it, however, before him, and took her leave of him with the show of no other concern than his uh, absence occasioned. But this she did not take from him, all suspicion of her following him, as she intended and had already laid a scheme for. For, from her first finding out that he had designed to leave her behind, she plainly saw it was for no other reason than being tired of her conversation. He was willing to be at liberty to pursue new conquests, and, wisely considering that complaints, tears, swoonings, and all the extravagancies which women make use of in such cases have little prevalence over a heart inclined to rove, and only serve to render those who practice them more contemptible by robbing them of that beauty which alone can bring back the fugitive lover, she resolved to take another course. And, remembering the height of transport, she enjoyed when the agreeable Beauplaisir kneeled at her feet, imploring her first favors, she longed to prove the same again. Not but a woman of her beauty and accomplishments might have beheld a thousand in that condition Beauplaisir had been, but, with her sex as modesty, she had not also thrown off another virtue equally valuable, though generally unfortunate, constancy. She loved Beauplaisir. It was only he whose solicitations could give her pleasure, and had seen the whole species despairing, 
dying for her sake, it might perhaps have been a satisfaction to her pride, but none to her more tender inclination. Her design was once more to engage him, to hear him sigh, to see him languish, to feel the strenuous pleasures of his eager arms, to be compelled, to be sweetly forced, to what she wished with equal ardor was what she wanted, and what she had formed a stratagem to attain, in which she promised herself success. She no sooner heard that he had left town than, making a pretense to her aunt that she was going to visit a relation in the country, she went towards Bath, attended by but two servants, which she found reason to quarrel with on the road and discharged. Clothing herself in a habit she had brought with her, she forsook the coach and went into a wagon, in which equipage she arrived at Bath. The dress she was in was round-eared cap a short pet red petticoat, and a little jacket of grey stuff. All the rest of her accoutrements were answerable to these, and joined with a broad country dialect, a rude unpolished air, which she, having been bred in these parts, knew very well how to imitate. With her hair and eyebrows black, made it impossible for her to be known or taken for any other than what she seemed. Thus disguised, did she offer herself to service in a house where Beauclizier lodged, having made it her business to find out immediately where he was? Notwithstanding this metamorphosis, she was still extremely pretty, and the mistress of the house happening at that time to want a maid was very glad of the opportunity of taking her. She was presently received into the family and had a post in it as she would have chosen had she been left at her liberty, that of making the gentlemen's beds getting them their breakfast, and waiting on them in their chambers. Fortune in this exploit was extremely on her side. There were no others of the male sex in the house than an old gentleman who had lost the use of his limbs with the rheumatism and had come thither for the benefit of the waters, and her beloved Beauplace here, so that she was in no apprehensions of any amorous violence but where she wished to find it. Nor were her designs disappointed. He was fired with the first sight of her, and though he did not presently take any further notice of her than giving her one or two or three hearty kisses, yet she, who now understood that language but too well, easily saw they were prelude to substantial joys. Coming the next morning to bring his chocolate as he had ordered, he caught her by the leg, which the shortness of her petticoat did not in the least oppose, then pulling her gently to him, asked her how long he had been, she had been at service, how many sweethearts she had, if, there, if she had ever been in love, and many other such questions befitting one of the degree she appeared to be, all of which he answered with such seeming innocence as more inflamed the amorous heart of him who talked to her. He compelled her to sit in his lap and gazing on her blushing beauties, which, if possible, received attention from her plain and rural dress he soon lost the power of containing himself. His wild desires burst out in all his words and actions. He called her little angel, cherubim, swore he must enjoy her through death were to be the consequence, devoured her lips, her breasts with greedy kisses, held to his burning bosom her half-yielding, half-reluctant body, not suffered her to get loose till he had ravaged all and glutted each rapacious sense with the sweet beauties of the pretty Celia for that was the name she bore in the second expedition. Generous as liberality itself, to all whom gave joy this way, he gave her a handsome sum of gold, which she durst not now refuse for fear of creating some mistrust and losing the heart she so lately had regained. Therefore, taking it with a humble courtesy, as well counterfeited show of surprise and joy, she cried, O oh, law, sir, what must I do for all this? He laughed at her simplicity, and, kissing her again, though less fervently than he had done before, bade her not be out of the way when he came home at night. She promised she would not be, and very obediently kept her word. His stay at Bath exceeded not a month, but in that time he supposed country lass had persecuted him so much with her fondness that, in spite of eagerness with which he first enjoyed her, he had grown more wary of her than he had been of Fatimina, which she perceiving would not be troublesome, but quitting her service, remained privately in town till 
she heard he was on his return, and in that time provided herself of another disguise to carry on a third plot, which her inter inventing brain had furnished her with once more to renew his twice decayed ardors. The dress she ordered to be made was such as widows wear in their first mourning, which, together with the most afflicted and penitential countenance as what's ever seen, was no small alteration to her who used to seem all gaiety. To add to this, her hair, which she was unaccustomed to wear very loose, both when Fantomina and Celia, was now tied back so straight, and her pinners coming so very forward, that there were none of it to be seen. In fine, her habit and her air were so much changed that she was not more difficult to be known in the rude country girl than she was now in the sorrowful widow. She knew that Beauplaisir came along in his chariot to Bath, and in the time of her being servant in the house where he lodged, heard nothing of anybody that was to accompany him to London, and hoped she would return in the same manner she had gone. She therefore hired horses and a man to attend her to an inn about thirteen miles on this side of Bath, where, having discharged them, she waited till the chariot should come by, which when it did, she saw that he alone was in it. She called to him that drove it to stop a moment. Going to the door, she saluted the master with these words. This distressed and wretched, sir, said she, never fail to excite compassion in a generous mind, and I hope I am not deceived in my opinion that yours is such. You have the appearance of a gentleman, and cannot, when you hear my story, refuse that assistance which is in your power to give an unhappy woman, who without it might be rendered the most miserable of all created beings. It would not be very easy to represent the surprise so odd an address created in the mind of him whom it was made. She had not the appearance of one who wanted charity, and what other favor she required he could not conceive. But telling her she might commend anything in his power gave her encouragement to declare herself in this manner. You may judge, resumed she, by the melancholy garb I am in, that I have lately lost all that ought to be valuable to womankind. But it is impossible for you to guess the greatness of my misfortune unless you had known my husband who was master of every perfection, to endear him to a wife's affection. But notwithstanding, I look on myself as the most unhappy of my sex in outliving him. I must so far obey the dictates of my discretion as to take care of the little fortune he left behind, which, being in the hands of a brother of his in London, will all be carried off to Holland, where he is going to settle. If I reach not the town before he leaves it, I am undone forever. To which end I left Bristol, the place at which we lived, hoping to get a place in the stage at Bath. But they were all taken up before I came, and being, by a hurt I got in a fall, rendered incapable of travelling any long journey on horseback, I have no way to go to London, and must inevitably be ruined in the loss of all I have on earth, without you, without you have good nature enough to admit me to take part of your chariot. Here, the famed widow ended her sorrowful tale, which had been several times interrupted by a parenthesis of sighs and groans, and Beauplaisir, with a complacent and tender air, assured her of his readiness to serve her in things of much greater consequence than what she desired of him, and told her it would be an impossibility of denying a place in his chariot to a lady who he could not be held without yielding one in his heart. She answered the compliments he made to her with but tears, which seemed to stream in such abundance from her eyes that she could not keep her handkerchief from her face one moment. Being come into the chariot, Beauplaisir said a thousand handsome things to persuade her from giving way to so violent a grief, which he told her would not only be destructive to her beauty, but likewise her health. But all his endeavors for consolement appeared ineffectual, and he began to think he should seem so obstinately devoted to the memory of her dead husband that there was no getting a word from her on any other theme. But thinking himself of the celebrated story of the Ephesian matron, 
it came into his head to make trial whether she who seemed equally susceptible of sorrow might also be so too of love. And, having began a discourse on almost every other topic and finding her still incapable of answering, he resolved to put it to the proof if this would have no more effect to rouse her sleeping spirits. With a gay air, therefore, though accompanied with the greatest modesty and respect, he turned the conversation, as though without design, on that joy-giving passion, and soon discovered that was indeed the subject which he was best pleased to be entertained with. For, on his giving her a hint to begin upon, never any tongue run more voluble than hers on the prodigious power it had to influence the souls of those possessed of it to the actions even the most distant from their intentions, principles, or humors. From that she passed on it to a description of the happiness of mutual affections, the unspeakable ecstasies of those who meet with equal ardency, and represented it in colors so lively and disclosed by gestures with which her words were accompanied, and the accent of her voice so true a feeling of what she said, that Beauplaisir, without being as stupid as he was really the contrary, could not avoid perceiving the receipts of fire not yet extinguished in this fair widow's soul, which wanted but the kindling breath of tender sighs to light into a blaze. He now thought himself as fortunate as some moments before he had the reverse, and doubted not that before they parted he should find a way to dry the tears of this lovely mourner to the satisfaction of them both. He did not, however, offer, as he had done to Fantomina and Cecilia, to urge his passion directly to her, but by a thousand little softening artifices, which he knew well how to use, gave her leave to guess he was enamored. When they came to the inn where they were to lie, he declared himself somewhat more freely, and, perceiving she did not resent it past forgiveness, grew more enroaching still, he now took the liberty of kissing away her tears, and catching the sighs as they issued from her lips, telling her if grief was infectious, he resolved, resolved to have his share, protesting he would gladly exchange passions with her, and be content to bear her load of sorrow, if she would as willingly cease the burden of his love. She said little in answer to the strenuous pressures with which he last ventured to enfold her, but not thinking it was decent for the character she had assumed to yield so suddenly, and unable to deny both his and her own inclinations, she counterfeited a fainting and fell motionless upon his breast. He had no great notion that she was in a real fit, and the room they supposed they supped in, happening to have a bed in it, he took her in his arms and laid her on it, believing that whatever her distemper up was, that was the most proper place to convey her. He laid himself down by her and endeavored to bring her to herself, and she was too grateful to her kind physician at her returning sense to remove from the posture he had put her in without his leave. It may perhaps seem strange that Beauplaisir should in mere intimacies continue still to see. I know there are men who will swear it is an impossibility and that no disguise could hinder them from knowing a woman they had once enjoyed. In answer to these scruples, I can only say that beside the alteration which the change of her dress made in her, she was so admirably skilled in the art of feigning that she had the power of putting on almost any face that she pleased and knew so exactly how to form her behavior to the character she represented, that all the comedians at both playhouses are infinitely short of her performances. She could vary her very glances, tune her voice to the accents most inimaginable from those in which she spoke when she appeared herself, and these aids from nature joined to the wiles of art, and the distance between the places where the imagined Fantomina and Celia were, might very well prevent his having any thought that they were the same, or that the fair widow was either of them. It never as much entered his head, and, though he did fancy he observed in the face of the later, features were not altogether unknown to him, yet he could not recollect when or where he had known them, and being told by her that from her birth she had never removed from Bristol, a place where he never was, 
he rejected the belief of having seen her and supposed his mind had been deluded by an idea of some other whom she might have a resemblance of. They passed the time of their journey in as much happiness as the most luxurious gratification of wild desires could make them. And when they came to the end of it, parted not without a mutual promise of seeing each other often. He told her to what place she should direct a letter to him, and she assured him she would send to let him know where to come as soon as she was fixed in lodgings. She kept her promise, and, charmed with the continuance of his eager fondness, went not home but into private lodgings, whence she wrote to him to visit her the first opportunity and require for the fair widow Bloomer. She had no sooner dispatched his billet than she repaired to the house where she had lodged as Fantomina, charging the people if Beauplaisir should come there not to let him know she had been out of town. From thence she wrote to him in a different hand a long letter of complaint that he had been so cruel in not sending one letter to her all the time she had been absent, entreated to see him, and concluded with subscribing herself to him unalterably affectionate Fantomina. She received in one day answers to both these. The first contained these lines. To the charming bloomer, it would be impossible, my angel, for me to express the thousandth part of that infinity of transport the sight of you, dear, your dear letter gave me. Never was a woman formed to charm like you. Never did any look like you, writhe like you, bless like you, and nor did any man adore as I do. Since yesterday we parted, I have seemed a body without a soul, and you, not by this inspiring billet, gave me new life. I know not what by tomorrow I should have been. I will be with you this evening about five. Oh, tis an age till then, but the cursed formalities of duty oblige me to dine with my lord, who never rises from table till that hour. Therefore, adieu till then, sweet lovely mistress of the soul, and all the faculties of your most faithful Beauplaisir. The other was in this manner, to the lovely Fantomina. If you were half so sensible as you ought of your own power of charming, you would be assured to be unfaithful or unkind to you, would be among the things that are in their very nature and possibilities. It was my misfortune, not my fault, that you were not persecuted every, persecuted every post with the declaration of my unchanging passion, but I had unluckily forgot the name of the woman at whose house you are, and knew not how to form a direction that it might come safe to your hands. And indeed, the reflection how you might have misconstrued my silence brought me to town some weeks sooner than I intended. If you knew how I have languished to renew your, those blessings, which I am permitted to enjoy in your society, you would rather pity than condemn. Your ever faithful Beauplaisir. P.S. I fear I cannot see you till tomorrow. Some business has unluckily fallen out that will engross my hours till then. Once more, my dear, adieu. Traitor, she cried as soon as she had read them. This Thus, our silly, fond, believing sex are served when they put faith in men. So I had been deceived and cheated, had I like the rest believed and sat down, mourning in absence, and vainly waiting recovered tenderness. How do some women, continued she, make their life a hell, burning in fruitless expectations and dreaming out their days in hopes and fears, then wake at last to all things? the honor horror of despair, but I have outwitted even the most subtle of the deceiving kind, and while he thinks to fool me, he is himself the only beguiled person. She made herself most certainly extremely happy in the reflection of the success of her stratagems, and while the knowledge of his inconstancy and levity of nature kept her from having that real tenderness for him she would else have had, she Fond, found the means of gratifying the inclination she had for his agreeable person in as full a manner as she could wish. She had all the sweets of love, but had yet tasted none of the gall, and was in a state of contentment which might be envied by the more delicate. 
When the expected hour arrived, she found that her lover had lost no part of the fervency with which he had parted from her. But the next day, when she received him as Fantomina, she perceived a prodigious difference, which led her again into reflections on the unaccountableness of men's fancies, who still prefer the last conquest only because it is the last. Here was an evident proof of it, for there could not be a difference in merit because they were the same person, but the widow Bloomer was a more new acquaintance in Fantomina, and therefore seemed more valuable. This, indeed, must be said of Beauplaisir, that he had a greater share of good nature than most of his sex, who, for the most part, when they are weary of intrigue, break it entirely off without any regard to the despair of the abandoned nymph. Though he restrained no more than a bare pity and complacence for Fantomina, yet, Believing she loved him to an excess, he would not entirely forsake her, though the continuance of his visits was now become rather a penance than a pleasure. The widow Bloomer triumphed some time longer over the heart of this inconstant, but at length her sway was at an end, and she sunk in his character to the same degree of tastelessness as she had done before in that of Fantomina and Celia. She presently perceived it but bore it as she always had done, it being but what she expected, she prepared herself for it, and had another project in embryo, which she soon ripened into action. She did not, indeed, complete it altogether so suddenly as she had done the others, by reason there must be persons employed in it, and the aversion she had to any confidence in her affairs, and the caution with which she had hitherto acted, and which she was determined to continue, made it very difficult for her to find, without breaking through that resolution, to compass what she wished. She got over the difficulty at last, however, by perceiving in a manner, if possible, more extraordinary than all her former behavior. Muffling herself in her hood one day, she went into the park, about the hour when there are a great many nesses, nest necessitous gentlemen who think themselves above doing what they call little, little things for maintenance, walking in the mall to take them a chameleon retreat and fill their stomachs with air instead of meat. Two of those who by their physiognomy she thought most proper for her purpose, she beckoned to come to her, and taking them into a walk more remote from company, began to communicate the business which she had with them in these words. I am sensible, gentlemen, said she, that though the blindness of fortune and partiality of the world merit frequently goes unwarded, unrewarded, and that those of the best pretensions meet their last encouragement, I ask your pardon, continued she, perceiving they seem surprised, if I am mistaken in the notion that you too may perhaps be of the number of those who have reason to complain of the injustice of fate. But if you are such as I take you for, I have a proposal to make you, which may be of some little advantage to you. Neither of them made any immediate answer, but appeared buried in consideration for some moments. At length, we should doubtless, madam, said one of them, willingly come into any measures to oblige you, provided they are such as may bring us into no danger, either as to our persons or reputations. That which I require of you, resumed she, has nothing in it criminal. All I desire is secrecy in what you are entrusted, and to disguise yourself in such a manner as you cannot be known if hereafter seen by the person whom you are to impose. In fine, the business is only an innocent frolic, but if blazed abroad, might be taken for too great a freedom in me. Therefore, if you resolve to assist me, here are five pieces to drink my health, and I assure you that I have not discoursed you on an affair I design not to proceed in. And when it is accomplished, fifty more lie ready for your acceptance. These words, above all, the money, which was a sum tis probable they had not seen in a long time, made them immediately assent to all she desired and pressed for the beginning of their employment. But things were not yet ripe for execution, and she told them that the next day they should be let into the secret charging them to meet her in the same place at an hour she appointed. Tis hard to say which of these parties went away best pleased. They, that fortune, had sent them so unexpected a windfall, or she, 
that she found persons who appeared so well qualified to serve her. Indefatigable in the pursuit of whatsoever her humor was bent upon, she no sooner left her new engaged emissaries than she went in search of a house for the completing of her project. She pitched on one very large and magnificently furnished, which she hired by the week, giving them the money beforehand to prevent any inquiries. The next day she repaired to the park, ordering them to follow her to the house she had taken, told them they must condescend to appear like servants, and gave each of them a very rich livery. Then, writing a letter to Beauplazier in a character vastly different from either those she had made use of as Fantomina or the fair widow Bloomer, ordered one of them to deliver it into his own hands, to bring back an answer, and to be careful that he sifted out nothing of the truth. I do not fear, said she, that you should discover to him who I am, because this is a secret of which you yourselves are ignorant. But I would have you be so careful in your replies that he may not think the concealment springs from any other reason than your great integrity to your trust. Seem, therefore, to know my whole affairs, and let you are refusing to make them partaker in the secret appear be only the effect of your zeal for my interest and reputation. Promises of my of entire fidelity on one side and reward on the other being passed, the messenger made what haste he could to the house of Beauplazier, and being told where he might find him, performed exactly the injunction which had been given to him. But never astonishment exceeded that which Beauplazier felt at the reading of this billet, in which he found these lines. To the all-conquering Beauplazier, I imagine not that tis a new thing to you to be told that you are the greatest charm in nature to our sex. I shall therefore not fill up my letter with any impertinent praises on your wit and person, only tell you that I am infinite in love with both and, if you have a heart not too deeply engaged, should think myself the happiest of my sex in being capable of inspiring it with some tenderness. There is but one thing in my power to refuse you, which is the knowledge of my name, which, believing the sight of my face will render no secret, you must not take it ill that I conceal from you. The bearer of this is a person I can trust. Send by him your answer, but endeavor not to dive into the meaning of this mystery, which will be impossible for you to unravel at, at any at the same time very much disoblige me, but that you may be in no apprehension of being imposed on by a woman unworthy of your regard. I will venture to assure you the first and greatest men in the kingdom would think themselves blessed to have that influence over me you have, though unknown to yourself, acquired. But I need not go about to raise your curiosity by giving you an idea of what my person is. If you think fit to be satisfied, resolve to visit me tomorrow about three in the afternoon, and, though my face is hid, you shall not want sufficient demonstration that she who takes these unusual measures to commence a friendship with you is neither old nor deformed. Till then I am yours, incognita. He had scarce come to the conclusion before he had asked the person who brought it from what place he came, the name of the lady he served, if she were a wife or a widow, and several other questions directly opposite to the direction of the letter. But silence would have availed him as much as did all those testimonies of curiosity. No Italian bravo employed in the business of the like nature performed his office with more artifice, and the impatient inquirer was conceived that nothing but doing as he was desired could give him any light into the character of the woman who declared so violent a passion for him. And, fearing any consequence which could ensure from uh, such an encounter, he resolved to rest satisfied till he was informed of everything from himself, not imagining this incognita varied so much from the generality of her sex as to be able to refuse the knowledge of anything to the man she loved with that transcendency of passion she possessed, she professed, and which his many successes with the ladies gave him encouragement enough to believe. He therefore took pen and paper and answered her letter in terms tender enough 
for a man who had never seen the person to whom he wrote. The words were as follows, to the obliging and witty incognita. Though to tell me I am happy enough to be liked by a woman of your manner, writing, I imagine you to be, is an honor which I can never sufficiently acknowledge. Yet I know not how I am able to content myself with admiring the wonders of your wit alone. I am certain a soul like yours must shine in your eyes with a vivacity which must bless all they look on. I shall, however, endeavor to restrain myself in those bounds you are pleased to set me in, till, by the knowledge of my inviolable fidelity, I may be thought worthy of gazing on that heaven I am now but to enjoy in contemplation. You need not doubt my glad compliance with your obliging summons. There is a charm in your lines which gives too sweet an idea of their lovely author to be resisted. I am all impatient for the blissful moment which is to throw me at your feet and give me an opportunity of convincing you that I am your everlasting slave, Beauplazier. Nothing could be more pleased than she to whom it was directed at the receipt of this letter, but when she was told how inquisitive he had been concerning her character and circumstances, she could not forbear laughing heartily to think of the trick she had played him and applauding her own strength of genius and force of resolution by which such unthought of ways could triumph over her lover's inconstancy and render that very temper to which other women is the greatest curse a means to make herself more blessed. Had he been faithful to me, said she herself, either as Fantomina or Celia or the widow Bloomer, the most violent passion, if it does not change its object in time, will wither. Possession naturally abates the vigor of desire, and I should have had, at best, a cold, inspit husband-like lover in my arms. But by these arts of passing on him as a new mistress, whenever the ardor, which alone makes love a blessing, begins to diminish from the former one, I have him always raving, wild, impatient, longing, dying. Oh, that all neglected wives are fond, abandoned nymphs, would take this method. Men would be caught in their own snare and have no cause to scorn our easy, weeping, wailing sex. Thus did she pride herself as if secure she should never have any reason to repent the present gaiety of her humor. The hour drawing nearer in which he was to come, she dressed herself in a magnificent manner as if she were to be that night at a ball at court, endeavoring to repair the want of those beauties which the wizard should conceal by setting forth the others with the greatest care and exactness. Her fine shape and air and neck appeared to great advantage, and by that which was to be seen of her one night might believe the rest to be perfectly agreeable. Beauplazier was prodigiously charmed, as well with her appearance as with the manner she entertained him, but though he was wild with impatience for the sight of a face which belonged so to so exquisite a body, yet he would not immediately press for it, believing before he had left her he should easily obtain the satisfaction. A noble collation being over, she began to sue for the performance of her promise of granting he began to sue for the performance of her promise of granting everything he could ask except the sight of her face and knowledge of her name. It would have been a ridiculous piece of affection in her to have seemed coy in complying with what she herself had been the first in desiring. She yielded without even a show of reluctance. And if there be any true felicity in an armor such as theirs, both here enjoyed it to the full. But not in the height of all their mutual raptures could he prevail on her to satisfy his curiosity with the sight of her face. She told him that she hoped he knew so much of her as might serve to convince him that she was not unworthy of his tenderest regard, and if he could not content himself with that which she was willing to reveal, and which the conditions of their meeting, dear as he was to her, she would rather part with him forever than consent to gratify an inquisitiveness which, in her opinion, had no business with his love. It was in vain that he endeavored to make her sensible of her mistake and that this restraint was the greatest enemy imaginable to the happiness of them both. She was not to be persuaded, and he was to, obliged to desist his solicitations, 
though determined in his mind to compass what he so ardently desired before he left the house. He then turned the discourse wholly on the violence of the passion he had for her, and expressed the greatest discontent in the world at the apprehensions of being separated, swore he could dwell forever in her arms, and with such an undeniable earnestness pressed to be permitted to tarry with her the whole night, that he had she been less charmed with his renewed eagerness of desire, she scarce would have had the power of refusing him. But in granting this request, she was not without a thought that he had another reason for making it beside the extremity of his passion, and had it immediately in her head how to disappoint him. The hours of repose being arrived, he begged she would retire to her chamber, to which she consented, but obliged him to go to bed first, which he did not much oppose, because he supposed she would not lie in her mask, and doubted not, but the morning's dawn would bring the wish discovery. The two imagined servants ushered him to his new lodging, where he lay some moments in all the perplexity imaginable at the oddness of his adventure. But he, she suffered not these cogitations to be of any long continuance. She came, but came in the dark, which, being no more than he expected by the former part of her proceedings, he said nothing of, but as much satisfaction as he found in her embraces, nothing ever longed for the approach of day more, with more impatience than he did. As last it came, but how great was his disappointment when, by the noises he heard in the street, the hurry of the coaches, and the cries of the penny merchants, he was convinced it was night, nowhere but with him. He was still in the same darkness as before, for she had taken care to blind the windows in such a manner that not the least chink was left to let the day in. He complained of her behavior in terms that she would not have been able to resist yielding to if she had not been certain it would have been the ruin of her passion. She therefore answered him only as she had done before, and, getting out of the bed from him, flew out of the room with too much swiftness for him to have overtaken her if he had attempted it. The moment left him, the two attendants entered the chamber, and, plucking down the implements which had screened him from the knowledge of that which he so much desired to find out, restored his eyes once more to day. They attended to assist him in dressing, brought him tea, and by their obsequiousness let him there was let him see there was but one thing which the mistress would not gladly oblige him in. He was not so much out of humor, however, at the disappointment of his curiosity, that he resolved never to make a second visit. Finding her in an outer room, he made no scruple of expressing the sense he had of the little trust she must repose in him. She reposed in him, and at last plainly told her he could not submit to receive obligations from a lady who thought him incapable of keeping a secret which she made no difficulty of letting her servants into. He resented. He once more entreated. He said all that any man could do to prevail on her to unfold the mystery, but in all his adorations were fruitless. And he went out of the house determined never to re-enter it, till she should pay the price of his company with the discovery of her face and circumstances. She suffered him to go with this resolution, and doubted not but he would recede from it when he reflected on the happy moments they passed together. But if he did not, she comforted himself with design of forming some other stratagem with which to impose on him a fourth time. She kept the house and her gentleman equipage for about a fortnight, in which time she continued to write to him as Fantamina, as the widow bloomer, and received the visits he sometimes made to each. But his behavior to both was grown so cold that she began to grow as wary of receiving his now instant caresses as he was of offering them. She was beginning to think in what manner she should drop these two characters when she, the sudden arrival of her mother, who had been sometime in a foreign country, obliged her to put an immediate stop to the course of her whimsical adventures. That lady, who was severely virtuous, did not approve of many things which she had been told of the conduct of her daughter, 
And though it was not in the power of any person in the world to inform her of the truth of what she had been guilty of, yet she heard enough to make her keep her afterward in a restraint little agreeable to her humor and the liberties to which she had been accustomed. But this confinement was not the greatest part of the trouble of now affected lady. She found the consequences of her amorous follies would be, without almost a miracle, impossible to be concealed. She was with child. And though she would easily have found means to have screened even this from the knowledge of the world, she had she been at liberty to have acted with the same unquestionable authority over herself as she did before the coming of her mother, yet now all her inter invention was at a loss for a stratagem to impose on a woman of her penetration. By eating little, lacing prodigious straight, and advantage of her great hoop petticoat, however, her bigness was not taken notice of, and perhaps she would not have been suspected till the time of her going into the country, where her mother designed to send her, and from whence she intended to make her escape to some place where she might be delivered with secrecy. If the time of it had not happened much sooner than she expected, a ball being at court, the good lady was willing she should partake in of the diversion of it as a farewell to the town. It was there that she was seized with those pangs which none in her condition are exempt from. She could not conceal the sudden rack with which all at once invaded her, or had her tongue been mirror, her wildly rolling eyes, the distortion of her features, and the convulsions which shook her whole frame in spite of her, would have revealed she labored under some terrible shock of nature. Everybody was surprised, everybody was concerned, but few guessed at the occasion. Her mother grieved beyond expression, doubted not, but she was struck with the hand of death, and ordered her to be carried home in a chair, while herself followed in another. A physician was immediately sent for, but he, presently perceiving what was her distemper, called the old lady aside and told her it was not a doctor of his sex, but one of her own her daughter stood in need of. Never was the astonishment and horror greater than that which seized the soul of this afflicted parent at these words. She could not for a time believe the truth of what she heard, but he insisting on it and conjuring her to send for a midwife she was at length convinced of it. All the pity and tenderness she had been for some moment before possessed of now vanished and were succeeded by an adequate shame and indignation. She flew to the bed of her daughter and, telling her what she had been informed of and what she was now far from doubting, commanded her to reveal the name of the person whose insinuations had drawn her to this dishonor. It was a great while before she could be brought to confess anything, and much longer before she would be prevailed on to name the man who, so, who she so fatally had loved. But the rack of nature growing more fierce, and the enraged old lady protesting no help should be afforded her while she persisted in her obstinacy, she, with great difficulty and hesitation in her speech, at last pronounced the name of Beauplazier. She had no sooner satisfied her weeping mother than that sorrowful lady sent messengers at the same time for the midwife and for that gentleman who had occasioned the others being wanted. He happened to be, by accident, at home and immediately obeyed the summons, though prodigiously surprised what business a lady so much a stranger to him could have to impart. But how much greater was his amazement when, taking him into her closet, she there acquainted him with her daughter's misfortune, of the discovery she had made, and how far he was concerned in it. All the idea one can form of wild astonishment was what he felt. He assured her that the young lady, her daughter, was a person whom he had never more than at a distance admired, and that he indeed spoke to her in the public company, but that he had never thought a thought which tended to her dishonor. His denials, if possible, added to the indignation she was before inflamed with. She had no longer patience, and carrying him into the chamber where she had just delivered of a where she was just delivered of a fine girl, cried out, I will not be imposed on. The truth of you shall be revealed. 
Beau Plaisir, being brought to the bedside, was beginning to address himself to the love to the lady in it to beg she would clear the mistake her mother was involved in. When she, covering herself with the clothes, she ready to die and ready to die a second time with the inward agitations of her soul, shrieked out, Oh, I am undone, I cannot live and bear this shame. But the old lady, believing that now or never was the time to dive into the bottom of this mystery, forcing her to rear her head, told her she should not escape the scrutiny of a parent she had dishonored in such a manner, and pointed to blow plaisir. Is this the gentleman, she, said she, to whom you owe your ruin, or have you deceived me by a fictitious tale? Oh no, resumed the trembling creature, he is indeed the innocent cause of my undoing. Promise me your pardon, continued she, and I will relate the means. Here she ceased, expecting that she would reply, which, on hearing Beauplazier cry out, What mean you, madam, I am your doing, who has never harbored the least design in my, on you in my life? She did in these words, Though the injury you have done your family, she said, is of a nature which cannot justifiably hope forgiveness, yet be assured, I shall much sooner excuse you when satisfied of the truth than while I am kept in suspense, if possible, as vexatious as the crime itself is to me. Encouraged by this, she related the whole truth, and it is difficult to determine if both Plaisir or the lady were most surprised at what they heard. He, that he should have been blinded so often by her artifices, or she, that so young a creature, should have the skill to make use of them. Both of them for some time sat in profound reverie, till at length she broke the silence in these words. Pardon, sir, said she, the trouble I have given you. I must confess it was with a design to oblige you to repair the supposed injury you had done this unfortunate girl by marrying her. But now I know not what to say. The blame is wholly hers, and I have nothing to request further of you than that you will not divulge the distracted folly of what she has been guilty of. He answered her in terms perfectly polite, but made no offer of that which she, perhaps she expected, though could not now, informed of her daughter's proceedings, demand. He assured her, however, that if he would commit the newborn lady to his care, he would discharge it faithfully, but neither of them would consent to that, and he took his leave, full of cogitations, more confused than ever he had known to in his whole life. He continued to visit there to inquire after her health every day, but the old lady, perceiving that there was nothing likely to ensure from these civilities but perhaps a renewing of the crime, she entreated him to refrain, and as soon as her daughter was in a condition, sent her to a monastery in France, the abbess of which had been a particular friend, and thus ended an intrigue which, considering the time it lasted, was of full variety as any, perhaps, that many ages has produced.